So if you look at the very top of the first page, we're going to read through that together. Just as with the 111th Psalm, the very first words of this Psalm are what? Hallelujah or praise ye the Lord, which means exactly the same thing. Psalm 111 dealt with the works of the Lord. That's what we saw last week. 111 dealt totally with the works of the Lord. Psalm 112 is very similar, only it deals with the works of a godly man who knows the Lord and whose life is conformed to what God has shown him that a, a God-fearing man ought to be. And so that's, that's the difference between 111 and 112. 111 focuses on the, our great God and the wonderful works that he has done. Psalm 112 then shows us that we as followers of God ought to live our lives in such a way that we reflect God and we show his glory in how we live our lives. That's Psalm 112. Okay, so the, I told you I'm going to skip through those 15 points of similarities because I think you can check that. It would be, it'd be more interesting for you if you actually go back and look at the verses and compare them together. and You'll see how closely tied together these two psalms are. So let's go down to the bottom of that first page now. An emphasis in this psalm is the word righteous and also the noun righteousness. Here are the terms. Now, this is important to understand. Sometimes when we think of righteousness, we think in the New Testament sense, the just shall live by faith. And we think of the, the imputed righteousness that Jesus gives us by justification. That's not the focus on Psalm 112 because that New Testament doctrine wasn't clarified and made really clear to the Old Testament believers. Most of the time, the term righteousness as used in the Old Testament means just what it sounds like. Doing what is right. Being right before God and living your life in the right way that pleases God. And so that's the, that's the kind of an idea that it has. In the, you have to look at the context and the context makes it clear. That that's what it's referring to. So the word righteous as an adjective and righteousness as a noun speaks of char a character quality and deeds in harmony with God's standards. God has standards of right and wrong. He lays them down in the Bible. And he expects for you and me to live our lives according to those righteous and godly standards. Such qualities and deeds cannot be undone. Because God always acknowledges and rewards them. That's why he can say they endure forever. Godly character manifests itself in good and kind deeds toward others. Now I want to point out one more thing. And we're going to see this as we go through the psalm. Righteousness in this psalm particularly is thinking of one special manifestation of righteousness. Anybody have an idea what it is? One special way that a person who is right with God can manifest it. Yes. Jorge or George. Obedience is good, right. Okay, what were you going to say? Charity. Okay, put those two together. So God expects us as Christians to obey. And one of the ways we obey is being generous and good and helping those who are in need. Giving, giving gifts, giving to the Lord's work and giving to those who have need of help. So benevolence or charity. Uh, that's the focus of Psalm 112. You're going to see that as we go through it. And so in this particular case, righteousness is especially in the sense of, like James says in the book of James in the New Testament, you say you have faith and 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 yet you see your brother in need and you don't do anything to help him? Where's your faith? You need to prove your faith by how you live your life. And so this is what Psalm 112 is focusing on. Last line on the first page, this psalm shows us the happiness, the confidence, and the permanence of the God-fearing man, the God-fearing person, in brief contrast with an ungodly man. Okay, let's go over to the back side of that page. <coughs> Is there anybody else who needs a copy of the outline? Slip up your hand. We'll get, we'll get it to you. Anybody? All right. The happiness of the God-fearing man, verses 1 through 6. Notice it starts out in verse 1 after saying hallelujah. He says, blessed be the man that fears the Lord. 
Now, do you, do you remember how Psalm 111 ended? Look at the last verse of Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. So th that verse says that you should fear the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. So Psalm 112 starts by saying, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. And how do you know a man fears the Lord? He delights greatly in his commandments. You can say all day long, I fear God. I reverence God. I have him in awe and respect. But if you don't obey God, where's the proof? Where's the evidence that you really fear God? Okay? And so what does the word blessed mean? What's another way of saying that? Happy. One who is happy, one who is blessed. Uh, you'll see what I have there on the page. That is happy and fortunate. And so a God-fearing person, one who has reverential awe and respectful obedience and love toward God, is a blessed person. If you live your life for yourself, you're not going to be a blessed person. If you live your life for God, you are a blessed person. You're happy. It doesn't matter what happens in your life. I was reading in a magazine, a Christian uh, magazine this week, about a lady that's 88 years old, and she writes letters to her children and grandchildren. She has like 58 descendants, and she writes letters to them and tells about experiences in her life. And she talked about all the different things that God has done in her life. And one of the things she talks about is how when her husband was just in, her in his 50s, he was flying a plane, and the plane crashed, and he died. And she said, I just prayed that morning, God, and she didn't know this was going to happen when she prayed this. She and her kids were having devotions. Her husband was away somewhere. He's going to be flying back. And the plane crashed, and he never survived it. And after she prayed the prayer that morning, Lord, help us to accept whatever your hand gives us today. That was her prayer that morning. Help us to accept whatever your hand gives us today. Little did she know that God's hand was going to give her her husband who was going to pass away in a plane crash that day. And she said when she found out, she remembered what she had prayed that morning. And she said, I kept composed and God gave me strength. And she shared this with her kids. This is one of the letters, one of the 777 letters <laughs> she sent, has sent over the years to her kids and grandkids telling them about the things that God has done in her life. So you see, a, a God-fearing person can be blessed and happy no matter what happens in life, no matter how tough things are, no matter how difficult the problems are you have to face in your life. And that's where the proof of the pudding of your relationship with God will come out when you manifest faithfulness to God even when things are hard and difficult. Amen? Amen. That's, where, that's where we're really tested. And some of us are going through some real testing. I say, I say that generally. I'm not speaking about myself. But some of us are going through some real testings right now. Some really difficult times. But God still loves you and God is faithful. Let's move on or we'll never get through this. And so let's look at the happiness. The different ways that this psalm. I'm going to move this down so I don't get my implosions going into the microphone here. When I bend down. Um. Uh, First thing that we can see is personal delight. Chapter 1, the last part of verse 1. Because we delight in his commandments. And, and notice we don't just delight in God's commandments. See, it's one thing to obey God. But you and I can obey God grudgingly, can't we? Okay, just like the kid. Go clean your room. Okay. You know, and he goes and he cleans his room. Was that really obedience when you're doing it like that? No. And so when we obey God's commandments, notice the word. What word shows the enthusiasm about obeying there? Greatly. He greatly obeys his commandment. He greatly delights, excuse me, in obeying his commandments. It's not grudging obedience. Look at verse 2. Family blessing. Family blessing. His seed, this doesn't mean the seed you plant in the ground. This is talking about a person's physical seed. His children and grandchildren, okay? His descendants. It's his family and his offspring, and the verse says they will be mighty upon the earth. 
Now, the word mighty is a phrase that you'll find back. This expression, mighty on the earth, is used way back in Genesis. Of course, that would have been, yeah, that's uh, talking about Nimrod, who wasn't a godly person. And it was talking about Nimrod being a military powerful person. And he used it against God, not for God. Now, people might think of that expression when they read this here. But this is not talking about a person who has military might. His descendants are not militarily powerful. It's talking about mighty in spirit, mighty in godliness. That's the, that's the way it's being used here. Um, and so that's what I comment there under letter B. They are the generation of the upright, as verse 2 says. The generation of the upright. Upright means morally upstanding, living a life in a pleasing way to God. These people shall be blessed. This is the, isn't the word that means happy. It just means God will give a blessing to these people. So not only the person is, is blessed of God, but his children, his grandchildren, his offspring are blessed of God. And this is important. We all wish that for our families. Notice verse 3. What else, is, what else uh, evidences the happiness of, of the God-fearing person? He has material prosperity. Now, not everyone is materially rich. But generally speaking, God abundantly cares for his children. We may not be wealthy and rich, but this particular person is blessed with wealth. And, and you'll see why as we go through this. Because this person is using his wealth to be a blessing to others and to minister to the needs of others. And God keeps pouring out abundantly material blessings to him and to his family because they are using it for the glory of God. And God does that with some people because he knows he can trust them. Maybe some of us aren't as trustworthy if he makes us rich and so he doesn't make us all rich. Or whatever his motivation is, God knows what's best. But wealth and riches shall be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Because his wealth is directed toward others. And I told you about the emphasis in this psalm. His righteousness, as that is, as manifested in good deeds toward others. Acts of benevolence endures forever. Okay, let's go on and we'll come back to some of these points as we go through some of the other sections. Another way he is blessed, uh, he attends to the well-being of others. Look in verse 4. Unto the upright there arise lights in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. So the, these are the same. The first two qualities, gracious and righteous, were used for God back in Psalm 111. And it almost seems strange that here those same words are used of a godly person. But that makes sense because if we are followers of God, and God has these qualities of graciousness and compassion. Shouldn't we be like that too? Shouldn't we be gracious to people? Shouldn't we show compassion to people? And that's the point. We are supposed to manifest the ways of God in our lives. And so that's what his followers do as well. Jesus said, be therefore perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. Now we come a long way short of that. But that's our goal, is to act and live and manifest ourselves like our Heavenly Father. So gracious as, as also the recipients of God's grace. Compassionate as recipients of God's compassion. And then he adds righteous, conforming to God's divine standards based on his, God's character and God's way of acting. So the God fear is righteous in his character and actions, especially in showing benevolence. And you'll see that as we go along. And notice the word upright there in verse 4 again. It's the plural referring to all those who are upright. Unto those that are upright, including this particular person that's being described, there arises light in the darkness. The singular at the end of the verse saying he is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Some people think that's talking about God. And it would be true because it talked about God in Psalm 111. But all through this psalm, it's the person being talked about. And the things that were true of God in Psalm 111 are true of the person here in Psalm 112. So I'm convinced that these words are also describing the person. The person has these qualities. Okay. Therefore, look at number five there under D. God gives light 
And light here has the emphasis of joy, salvation, blessing, and darkness. And a lot of, a lot of times the idea of darkness means trouble and misery and all of that. Instead of trouble and misery, God gives joy, blessings, salvation, etc. to those that are God-fearing. Let's go on to letter E, verse, verses 5 and 6. He has personal well-being. He has given meat, that is food, unto those that fear. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong psalm. <laughs> I'm back to, I was looking at Psalm 111. A good man shows favor. I knew that didn't sound right. A good man shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. So let's look at some of these details. Personal well-being. Here the reading, technically the Hebrew, the construction in the Hebrew, good man or connected together with this connection in Hebrew that shows that the word good is not an adjective describing man. It's really sort of an expression, just like there's a, there's a similar expression in Psalm 111. It's, it means the same. Actually, back in verse 1, blessed is the man. It's the same kind of a construction that we have here in verse 5. Blessed is the man. This means a man, it is good for the man or it is well for the man. What, he, what verse 5 is saying, that a man is going to, it's going to be well in his life. It's going to be good for him. Because of what his life is and because of how he's living. And so it is good or well for this man. Along with wealth comes. Now, here's the thought. So God's promised him things are going to be blessed. He's going to have wealth and riches. But along with wealth comes the powerful and common temptation. Some people that are wealthy and rich tend to abuse their power. A lot of people do, don't they? Look at Jeffrey Epstein, people connected with him. What a scumbag. Of course, he's, he's finding out what a scumbag he is now, now that he's gone. But uh, uh, just think of all the people that, and we'll probably never find out everybody that was connected with him now that he's gone. And I'm not going to get into all the speculation about what really happened. But God is just and God will do justice in that situation too. But anyway. Uh, people do abuse their power. Thus, the psalmist places emphasis upon the man's graciousness and fairness. Look in verse five. Look in verse five. Uh, he is gracious and just. So uh, he shows favor, and he lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Okay, so this person is just he's a he, indeed a lender does have a powerful advantage over a borrower so let's look at some of these terms now generosity he shows favor that means he is gracious it's the same word that was used back in verse four it means that he's showing graciousness and he lends he gives to those that have need these are acts of charity, and these are not business actions. He's not looking for a person to pay him back with 10% interest. He's giving it, and he doesn't expect anything in return. That's the emphasis of this verse. And giving in the Old Testament, the emphasis was you don't expect, when you give to the poor, you don't expect anything back. And, and if he does return it, you don't expect any interest for it. And then notice the last part of verse 5. Uh, he will guide his affairs with discretion. The word discretion is the Hebrew word that means judgment or justice. So he will guide his affairs. Literally, he will provide or maintain his personal interests, the things that he does in his life, with justice. Often in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word judgment is best translated justice as it is here. Look at verse 6 now. Surely he will not be moved forever. This is why things are well with a God-fearing man. Forever he won't be moved. He's stable in his godly character and his acts of charity. He's going to stay the course. He's going to continue to live his life in this way. He's not going to be moved. He's going to stand true and steady for the Lord. And notice the last part of the verse also. He's going to be reputable. The righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. That is, he always is remembered as a righteous man since his life conforms to God's righteous standards. 
God remembers him and so do other people. Now, you and I, when, we, when it comes time to, for us to pass out of this life into the next life, I, you know, we probably think about, will anybody come to my funeral? And if they do, what are they going to say about, you know, I always think it's better to say the good things you want to say about a person when they're alive and don't wait until they're dead because they're not listening to you then. But, but if you want people to remember you in a good way, According to this, you need to live your life in a good way now and you need to honor God with your life and live a righteous life and be generous and kind and giving toward other people. And then when you then you will be held in remembrance. God will remember you and people will remember you as a righteous and a good and a godly person. Okay. Comments or questions on that before we go to the confidence of the God-fearing man? Okay, let's look at his confidence in verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8 say... He will not be afraid. There are a lot of people afraid of many things today. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid. Twice it says he won't be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemy. So let's comment on this. So look at the opening paragraph. Now we back in uh, the earlier verses, 5 and 6, we talked about one of the temptations of a wealthy person is to be abusive of his wealth, to mistreat people with it. There's another danger, potential danger with wealth, and that is the temptation to hold back on charity out of the fear of what can go wrong. Indeed, verse 8 shows he does have adversaries who may have been rivals to him. We see that in verse 8. And also verse 10 talks about a wicked person. So there must have been people that we don't know about here that are after this guy and are out to hurt him. But he doesn't fear. He doesn't fear. So notice here, the fear of losing one's wealth, of not having enough left for your own needs and for your dependents has kept many a wealthy person from giving generously to those in need. The answer is clear in the last part of verse 7 having a steadfast heart that trusts in the Lord. You can see a more complete development of this if you look at Psalm 37. The verse does not say that bad tidings are never going to come to this person, only that he is not going to be afraid of them. And so many times we think, oh, I need this much and I need that much and I'm never going to have enough. And some of you are retired and some are getting close to retiring in different situations in life. Oh, I got to have all this stashed away. And I hope I'm going to have enough to live. And so you can't be generous to other people and give to other people because you're worried about yourself. And that's a common temptation. The fear of the future and the fear of what might happen. And therefore, I can't give to the Lord and I can't be generous toward God's work because of that. This psalm should warn us against having that kind of an attitude. Okay, let's go on. And I'm not saying that because of any particular reason in our church. I'm just saying that because that's what's in Psalm 112. And we need to preach what God gives us in his word, right? We need to teach it the way he has it here. Okay. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. This is not a reference to merely anticipating that bad things might happen. It refers to the actual reports of bad things occurring. The text refers to what is heard when evil tidings come. What is our response? Well, let's not be afraid. The source of confidence is in the last part of verse 7. This is why he can be confident. This is why I can be confident. This is why you can be confident. Because we're trusting in the Lord. Now, let me just give you a little personal illustration here. This is one. I, quote, retired last October. Now, the only income I have is that little bit of Social Security I get. Cindy is contemplating retirement. It's a little harder for a female than a male when it comes to things like this. this the issue of security is a little, little more of a struggle sometimes. And there's been, oh, what, what, what if I retire and we don't have enough to live on? <laughs> so, I don't, so when I talk about these things, this, I'm not talking out of the clear blue sky. I've had some experiences, and you've had some experiences, and you know what it's like. 
Some of you are retired, and some of you know you have to sometimes pinch pennies, and, and you can't always buy everything you want to buy. But here's the, here's the point. Is God faithful? Does God take care of you? How about you who are retired? Is God still taking care of you? Have you, have you had to go to the uh, food shelter? Uh, or has God provided for your needs? And God will take care of you if you'll trust him and just yield your life to him and do what's right. He will, he will take care of you. So I've encouraged my wife, honey, don't be afraid. When the time comes and it's time to retire, you're going to retire and we're going to be just fine. And I know, I'm not just saying that because I want to make her feel better. I really believe that. And so we all need to believe that. It's true. God will take care of us. David said, I have been a young man and now I am an old man. I've never seen, I can't remember the exact words. You know the passage I'm thinking of. Never seen God's children begging bread or something to that effect. God takes care of his own. If you're faithful and live for him, he will take care of you. You may not be rich, but he will provide for your needs. Okay, so the source of confidence. Let's go over to the last page. Uh, the solidity of his confidence. So the source is trusting in God, and therefore, verse 7, his heart is fixed, steady. It's steadfast. It's not fickle, and it's not cowardly. And then notice verse 8, the first part of verse 8 says, his heart is established, a different word, but the same basic idea. It's established. It's upheld. God supports it. The same word was used back in verse 8 of Psalm 111 that says God's words are upheld and established. Now God is upholding the heart of his child. God does that. And then notice the safety of confidence. He will not be afraid. That's spoken in verse 7, and it's also spoken in verse 8. God must know there's a real temptation for us to be afraid. And we know that's true, don't we? I was uh, at my granddaughter's softball game yesterday, and uh, they were talking about going to a particular place, and they were going to be helping prepare food boxes for poor people. And I heard my gr one of my granddaughters say, Hope there's not a shooter there. Well, you know, you don't know what kids are thinking because they hear about this stuff in the news all the time. I go here, what if there's a shooter there? What if there's a shooter over here when we go there? And, and we do live in an insecure and uncertain world. But if you're a child of God, do you have to worry about it? Shooter could come in here in church someday like they did down in Texas. Remember that? It could happen. We try to take precautions here. And we have people that are hopefully prepared if something like that were to happen. But you never know what could happen in life. That's where trust in God comes in. You can't sit around. You could, but we're not to sit around worrying about stuff like that. There's a solidity of confidence in the life of a Christian. And there's safety in confidence. That's where we are right now. Uh, it doesn't imply that he will will be afraid after this because look notice the way it's stated there uh, in the last part of verse 8 it says until he shall not be afraid until he sees his desire on his enemies I'm going to comment on that last expression later but the word until doesn't mean he won't be afraid until then he'll be afraid that's not what it means once God is taking care of his enemies then he won't have any reason to be afraid he's not going to be afraid now but even after that happens he's not going to be afraid because then there's no more reason to even be afraid so God will keep him from fear and let's look at the last section starting at verse 9 the permanence of the God fearing man now we talked about two pitfalls the pitfall of the potential abuse of power and money and we also talked about the pitfall of fear that keeps you from doing what God wants you to do to be a blessing and to minister to the needs of others. And now there's a pitfall of being a miser. Of being a miser. This psalm has already taught against this in verses 5 and 6 where he says, A good man shows favor and he lends. He guides his affair with discretion or justice. He's always thinking about how he can help other people and be a blessing to other people. Verse 6. Surely he will not be moved forever. The righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. Okay. But now verse 9 especially focuses on this. 
Paul quotes from this. Let's look at 2 Corinthians just for a moment. 2 Corinthians 9, 9. Verse 9, or verse 9 of our psalm is quoted in 2 Corinthians 9, 9. That's how you can remember where to look for it in the New Testament. Verse 9 is quoted in chapter 9, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians. I just now thought of that. I hadn't thought of it before just now. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9. That way I'll remember where it is too. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. Now, what's Paul talking about here in 2 Corinthians 9? Anybody remember the context of chapters 8 and 9? What's he talking about? He's talking about giving. Look back, for example, at the beginning of chapter 8. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you're, if you're in Corinthians, he says, Moreover, brethren, we want you to know about the grace of God that's bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. How in a great trial of affliction, now notice, the Christians in Macedonia, the, the churches in Macedonia were very poor. See what Paul says here. In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now that doesn't make sense. These people were extremely poor. They were in extreme affliction. And they were greatly generous. When I've been over in India and Africa and places like that, you see people that have practically nothing and they're some of the most generous people in the world. Uh, when we were in Russia, uh, we ate in the home of a godly man called Peter Romachik. Anybody ever heard of Peter Romachik? He just died this year, January, February, something like that at this year. He was a godly Russian pastor back in the days of communism where they weren't allowed to preach the gospel, but he preached the gospel anyway. And they trumped up charges against him again and again and again. He had a number of children, like five or six children. And while his children were growing up, he was thrown in prison seven or eight times. And most of the years that they were at home growing up, he was in prison. He spent 26 years of his life in prison. He didn't die in prison. He could have. The conditions were miserable. You think prison is bad in America? They talk about Rikers and what a terrible place it is. It's paradise compared to prison in Russia. I mean, it's just horrendous conditions. And he survived it. He wouldn't budge. He wouldn't compromise. And every time they would release him, they said, no, just don't go and preach again and we'll leave you alone. Well, guess what he would do? He would go and preach again because God told him to preach. He was a Baptist preacher in Russia. And when I was over in Russia back in 2001, 2002, somewhere around there, went over with another man and we, I taught in a Bible college over there and in Ukraine and also taught in Moscow, in the Moscow area. And while we were in the Moscow area, we were invited to Peter Romachik's home and they gave us dinner. And it was a lavish spread of food. And when we left, the missionary that I was with, because he had been to Russia several times, that was my first trip, he said, I want you to understand something. The food that they gave us tonight is probably as much food as they will have for the entire week. You see what I'm saying? That's what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Macedonians were very poor, but they were very generous with what they had. I have seen that over and over again. It's the poor people who have very little that are generous. And God blesses them and enables and continues to meet their needs because they are generous. And so, and so this is what we're talking about here. Uh, so anyway, going back to that paragraph, I'm going to finish the paragraph and then we'll get done on time. Uh, Paul argues that God will not allow them to grow weak financially because of their generosity. That's, if you read 2 Corinthians 9, that's exactly what Paul is saying. He said, if you give generously, God will give you more so that you can give even more. God will continue to give to you so you can give to others, is what he's saying. God will not allow them to grow weak financially because of their generosity, but will increase their ability to give even more. Here the psalmist shows the same truth by saying that God exalts in honor his horn. Look at the last part of verse 9 again of Psalm 112. Uh, 
He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. The word dispersed is the word that's used in the Old Testament for sowing seed on your field. They would broadcast the seed on their field, and they sowed generously. They sowed a lot of seed because they wanted a big crop. The more you sow, the more crop you get. And so that's the idea of what he's saying here. When we give to others, we ought to give generously. We ought to spread it out. We ought to give it generously. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. Here's that same expression again. You see why I said earlier it's focusing on his giving when it says his righteousness will endure forever? His righteousness will endure forever because God will bless it. God will cause what he does to bear fruit that will last forever. Souls being saved, lives being changed. The, the works that we do on the, in the name of God and for the sake of God will have a permanence. Reading on, such lively love and concern for others is wholesome compared with the selfishness Paul had to rebuke in the Corinthians. Both this psalm and Paul encouraged the bold course as being the surest. Paul made his point to the Corinthians by pointing out the example of the Macedonians, and I already showed that to you, who practiced generous charity even while enduring extreme poverty. So look at the points there. His generosity, he has dispersed he has scattered, he has given to the poor. The point is he's given freely. His righteousness, we already talked about that, endures forever. His strength is mentioned in the last part of verse 9 in the word horn. The horn speaks of a ram's horn. That's the strength of a ram. He doesn't have strength anywhere else. It's his horns that he defends himself, that he fights off other animals, etc. So the horn of a person represents his strength. God will exalt our horn with honor. He will give us strength. He will give us honor. And all these have permanence because of our relationship with God. And then finally, what about people that aren't godly? There's one verse on them, verse 10. The wicked will see it. And I want you to note, notice something. Back in verse 8, it says the righteous will see his desire on his enemies. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But here the wicked sees something, but it's not what he wants to see. It's the opposite of what he wants to see. Because what does the wicked want to see? He wants to see bad things happen to godly people. That's what he wants to see. The wicked will see good things happening to this godly person, and it just eats him up inside, and it makes him angry and furious. Sounds like some of the things you hear in the news today. <laughs> I better not go there. But anyway, the wicked will see it and be grieved. So vexation there, he will see, but not with triumph and not with satisfaction as the righteous do. Instead, he will be grieved. That means he will be vexed and angry in his heart. And then notice his frustration. Have you ever gnashed your teeth at somebody? Literally? I know some people that gnash their teeth in their sleep. That's the grossest thing. I had a roommate that did that one time. Oh, that's gross. But anyway, the idea here, the Bible speaks in hell. There's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's in pain. This is talking about a wicked person that out of frustration gnashes his teeth and, and then he melts away. It, it expresses impatient malignity, ill will towards somebody. And then melting away shows that he loses consistently, consistency becomes unhinged, and then he dies off. And then he has despair. Last line. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Whatever is important to him, whatever is precious to him, he's going to lose it all. He takes nothing to heaven with him. He loses it all. What's happening with Jeffrey Epstein's massive wealth right now? Is he enjoying any of it? None. None. What an example. What an example. What was he living his life for? Himself. And now he has nothing as a result. The wicked, this is a picture of the end of the road, the emptiness of a wicked life. A life, not live, a life lived for self and not lived for God. He, and then look at the last point, letter D. Goes back, that goes back to the last part of verse 8. The righteous man will see his desire upon his enemies. The idea of seeing that means satisfaction. That doesn't mean 
That doesn't mean he's, he's gloating over the bad things that happens to wicked people. It means that he knows that justice needs to be done to wicked people. Justice needs to be done. And his heart finds satisfaction in God's righteousness and God's justice. It's not personal vengeance. If it is, it's sinful. It's God satisfaction with what God does. So in conclusion, believers have a future. The ungodly don't. Believers have happiness, confidence, and permanence. What more can you ask for? Is there anything else that you can ask for, really? Psalm 112 is a wonderful little psalm. I hope you'll take it home and hope you'll meditate on it. Go back and look through that part that I skipped over. And may God bless your hearts. Maybe you could have family devotions over Psalm 112 and go back and review it later today. May God bless you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we've had to study your word. We pray you'll help us to take it to heart and take it seriously. And may we be this, this kind of godly person in the way we live our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.